As I said, my name is Fulvio. I'm from the Department of uh, Computer Engineering here uh, at Politecnico. And uh, I, you know, I had the pleasure to give the, a small introduction to this uh, summer school about, this week of summer school about uh, IoT applications and data management. And uh, um, I will be here tomorrow for the, so, so this morning for the introduction, and also we will meet again on Thursday for, for a, a more technical topic. So actually, when we started designing uh, this uh, last week, uh, we had uh, two different goals in mind. Okay, with discussion also with the Monica and Danilo, uh, we tried to. We, we hope huh? we have been able to, to maintain the parallel between two different goals. One is a technical goal and the other is a didactical teaching goal. The technical goal, uh, of course, is uh, related to the title uh, of, the, of the summer school about uh, IoT, Internet of Things, uh, and data management. And so we try to spend some time during the week uh, in understanding the technologies, the architectures, the solutions, the problems from the technical point of view. So what are, uh, uh, the IoT is a very, very wide topic. And uh, what are the main, uh, uh, or some of the main uh, issues, some of the main technologies, some of the main technologies? Okay, yes. And uh, that uh, are, today used uh, for creating, designing, experimenting this IoT system. One week would not be enough uh, for covering everything, so we selected somehow the topics uh, that are more or less uh, more so developed uh, inside Polytechnico. So we try to, to, <laughs> to talk also about uh, uh, something that we know that we already do. So this is the technical part, as we had uh, 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 for any you know, IoT class, but in parallel, uh, we also try to, to support a didactic goal, a teaching goal. Since we are all professors okay, in this room, uh, we think that uh, uh, it's not just uh, you know, teaching some technical topics, uh, but it should be to compare and to share the way in which these technical topics uh, are being uh, uh, described or being uh, uh, tackled are being taught in our courses and maybe in your courses in your universities. Hmm? Um, we think that I think uh, that uh, um, teaching uh, this sort of technical topics, where there are a lot of different technologies involved, is not the same or could not be done in the same way, you know, uh, as we can teach Fourier transforms. Uh, or uh, you know, some more uh, defined topic, or even assembly language, uh, or even uh, you know some sort of sensor design technologies. Uh, it, it's not easy in this case uh, to identify maybe one technology, one piece of the picture, and say, okay, we create a course on that, because IoT and modern IT architecture are distributed systems that are composed of many components that work together. And you don't understand the complexity until you try to put everything together. Okay? Every single piece is complex, but when you put them together, they just blow up. Huh? And uh, um, we need uh, to find or to try different teaching methods for helping our students uh, to understand these kind of systems. So that's why also, you know, some part, significant part of the time here will be devoted uh, also to, not just to, you know, uh, teaching some technical topics, uh, but also to describe how we work with our students, how we work in our labs, uh, and so on. And so I call it uh, sharing the technical approach. So something that we created during the years, uh, trying to adjust uh, the, our courses to, to make it better, to make it more 
uh, suitable to, to, to push the students a bit further. And what I hope <coughs> is that this, <coughs> sorry, this sharing could be a two-way sharing. Okay, so uh, I, I'm expecting also maybe that you can tell us what are your ideas, your experiences in this topic when you touch some, some specific topic when you describe some uh, way of teaching mm -hmm. so that we can both learn from from each other's experience. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's not uh, we are not in a course with the young students uh, that just need to sit uh, and uh, stay silent and learn, but uh, we try to. No, also to, to, to exploit this uh, activity, uh, this project for professional exchange, so I, I would really love it. Hmm? Okay, so these are the general settings of this, uh, um, of this course. Um, this is a picture of the schedule for the week. By the way, uh, you know, that all these slides are already available. Uh, Danilo sent you a link yesterday to a Google Drive where all the teachers will put their material. Okay, so uh, you, you can download them. I just put both the, P the PowerPoint and the PDF. Um, so this is the plan of the, of the week. So this morning will be it's Monday, so it will be shorter. Uh, it's only two hours, so we were planning to finish it at 11 or less. Hmm? Uh, the for introduction. So introduction to the school, to know each other, and uh, uh, some definitions about uh, these Internet of Things topics, uh, topic uh, that will uh, you know, last throughout the week. Then we have uh, um, three visits planned in the week. The first visit is already this afternoon at uh, uh, Telecom Italia. Uh, Telecom Italia. It's, uh, as the name says, it's a major telecom company, former public uh, telecom company. Now, of course, it's, a, it's a one of the private ones, uh, but it's the largest one, it's the incumbent uh, uh, one. And uh, they have uh, a research lab here in Torino. Since the, you know, probably more than 20 years ago, they started doing research on telecommunication, on propagation antennas, and so on. And they moved, of course, uh, to more so complex topics as the telecommunication network uh, grew more complex they had to develop uh, more you know skills uh, and uh, uh, last year yes just less than one year ago they opened a new lab just for showing to other companies uh, to universities and so on what can be done with the newest technologies so in this lab we will see this afternoon, there will be a visit organized for us. Uh, we will see probably um, the new uh, technology for fiber optic dis the distribution of internet. So we'll see the new fiber to the cabinet, fiber to the home. Uh, it's something that we, we read in the newspaper, but there is nice because you can actually see and touch you know, the fiber and see the cabinet and see the, the equipment there. So there will be one part about uh, the, the fiber uh, transmissions. There is one part of the lab uh, uh, on smart home technologies. So there's actually a small sort of apartment where any kind of uh, smart home device is integrated and so they can show what, what can be done today with these technologies. There is a part on uh, new 5G ultra wideband technologies where they show you some prototypes or new um, how to use this new uh, spread spectrum and uh, low uh, power transmission so for example there will be I remember from the last time I, I was there they have a, a gas meter you know the meter for the gas in your house they need to send data every day with a battery that will last 10 years uh, and so what kind of uh, transmission technologies uh, they use and also maybe that meter is uh, in the cellar underground so if there's a lot of shielding so it traditional technologies probably would not be your your smartphone will not be able to pick up any signals there, but your gas meter needs to be able to transmit. So how, how can you do that? So there will be some demo of that, of the antennas. They also have a... Um, oh, is the English word anechoic chamber? Is this an English word? A chamber where they test antennas. 
so a chamber that will absorb any kind of, ref of ref ref reflection okay, from, from, the, from the electromagnetic magnetic signal. So a chem chamber with all the cones and so on, so we can hopefully visit also that. And last, but not least, I think that what gives the name to the IoT lab, they also have a portion of a smart city. So there's a place outside where, where they have a bus stop, a simulated bus stop, a simulated um, stand when people can go and, uh, and uh, some street lamp and so on. They are all equipped with uh, IoT devices and there is a control room where we can see how the, all this data is controlled, how the data is uh, organized, how we, what can you do actually with this kind of, in the smart city context. Uh, what can you do with this kind of devices? So this will be today's afternoon's visit. And uh, the visit will start around 3 o'clock. Uh, we will take uh, 20 minutes to go there by bus. And so we, we try to be there a bit in advance because, as always, when you enter into a company, we need to spend some time in handling documents and stuff like that. So we try to be early so that we don't lose uh, you know, the precious time for the visit. So, this is for this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Another visit will be on Friday morning. There will be a couple of shorter visits, uh, but they are actually close to here. There are, there are two different uh, research centers. Actually, the first one, ISMB, is stands for Instituto Superiore Mario Boella, which is a research center which is located inside the campus of the Politecnico. So just, uh, Probably you walked uh, in front of it last week, uh, more than once. Uh, and uh, this ISMB is divided into, if, if I remember correctly, seven different uh, branches or laboratories where they deal with different technologies, from uh, uh, photonics and antennas to uh, navigation, GPS uh, technologies, to IoT, and to user interfaces, mobile development, and so on, security labs, and so on. So there will be a visit uh, to this research center, and next to that, uh, this big data lab is a laboratory inside Polytechnico. So will be the responsible media, uh, responsible of this lab that will tell you what kind of equipment we have or is needed to do some big data computation and what kind of applications uh, they are currently uh, running and using. Hmm? So this will be the I think the most interesting part of the school so that we can touch and see really for real uh, what actually can be done with this uh, IoT and uh, um, data management. All the rest will be here and uh, we have some uh, parts which are more descriptive and some parts which are more practical. Uh, for example, we have uh, tomorrow uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, networking issues. So wireless networking. In the morning, we will have uh, uh, Carla Chiesserini will tell us about this uh, new brand type of networks uh, that uh, are used to connect sensors. Mm, that needs to be self-configuring, low power, uh, high range, high re reliable, and so on, which is not the real uh, Wi-Fi, uh, the normal Wi-Fi or networks uh, because there are different requirements. And in the afternoon, Guido Montorsi uh, will show you some practical experience in the lab about this kind of wireless networks. Mm. Um, so the morning will be in this room, 11B, and the afternoon will be in the lab, in one of the labs uh, in the electronics uh, departments. Uh, as, uh, you, last week you were on the fifth floor, and the lab will be uh, you know, on the second floor. But of course we will walk you there mm. together. Uh, Wednesday morning, uh, in the morning we have Giovanni Mannato who will talk about mobile applications mm. because in many cases the, all the data now that is collected by the sensors and so on will be uh, used by the user, will be received by the user also using mobile applications. So mobile, mobile device is used for at least two different purposes in the IoT. One is for collecting data, because a smartphone has uh, maybe 15 different sensors inside. And, uh, um, and so you can collect position, acceleration, 
uh, lightning and so on uh, so a sort of information but also can be used to deliver the user interface and uh, uh, so this will be the morning where uh, Giovanni will have a give an overview about uh, the, the architecture of Mumbai application so how it's how they are constructed how they are integrated in larger networks uh, but more importantly he will also describe how it tries to deal with the with the user element uh, the real issue uh, the real topic uh, in this whole week uh, will be that uh, we have users humans people the need to use the systems and they also always create problems it's not easy so it's not just we need to uh, solve technical issues but at the end uh, create a system that is useful for the users and it's not always uh, if you put the best technologies you have it's there's not a guarantee that the users will like it or will use it uh, so we also need uh, and especially we need uh, to take this into account so i'm trying in a way to you know shift the focus from the technology to the user for which this technology is useful is that a question yes you were talking about future applications or something that currently is uh, in, in use and can be used uh, <clears throat> i would say that uh, everything the iot domain is actually in we are in the phase where we are people are or industries are deploying proof of concept or prototypes uh, there are very very few real uh, running uh, complete finished closed uh, application of, of iot now, there are a lot of experiences of uh, you know uh, companies that are sort of probing you know? they are sending probes to say okay let's try to do this and let's uh, look and see so right now uh, what we can see is that the, the field is shaping so we try to see what kind of ingredients we have and we see some application errors and inside this application there are a lot of trials experiments and so on and all of this will probably translate in the future into real services but for now if i had to name a real iot service there are some one but they are small okay Companies call themselves say, okay, this is an IoT server, but if you look at it, some places are always missing, mm -hmm. for example. So that's... Okay, you talk about uh, the companies that uh, uh, are working in, in, in the uh, Well, we can give some examples. Uh, unfortunately, there are some examples in the bad sense, uh, not in the good yeah. sense, because uh, some... No, but I, I'll... Uh, we'll, later, I'll, later today, I'll try to... to let's say to stress the dangers that this kind of uh, uh, trial at, uh, attempts uh, uh, are, are given hmm? and um, so where was okay about the application so we will talk about how we could organize the the course on mobile application that Giovanni Imanati has here at the Polytechnico um, by putting together computer engineering students and psychology students putting them together to develop the concept of the mobile application and it's a nice experience people will fight people will cry but at the end they will uh, deliver something in uh, wednesday afternoon we'll talk more about the data science aspects so tanya chapitelli with uh, eight months pregnant, so <laughs> uh, let's hope for her that everything is fine. And uh, uh, we'll come here and uh, talk to us about uh, uh, the, let's say, methods for analyzing big data, large data, because actually all these uh, architectures where we have sensors everywhere will generate a lot of data. Mm. And a lot of data is difficult to process tends to be useless unless uh, you have ways to extract good knowledge, good information out of them. Mm -hmm. So that would be the topic for Wednesday afternoon. And it will be also linked uh, with the Big Data Lab uh, that we will see on, on Friday. So actually here we see that the methods, the algorithms, 
the technologies for data processing that we will, be, we will see in practice uh, on Friday morning, right? Okay, then Thursday. <coughs> Thursday is a topic that is labeled uh, ambient intelligence. Morning and afternoon. In the morning I will be here again. And in the afternoon, Luigi De Rossit, which is one of my postdoc students, uh, we continue. And uh, we are using this word ambient intelligence as one possible important application of IoT. IoT, Internet of Things, is too, is too, techno too much uh, linked to technology. It has a technology connotation. Uh, what are these technologies used for? How can they be used for something, for the users? For making, for example, ambient environments more intelligent. So we'll see about the design issues, about where, okay, at this point we have the best technologies and we see how to put them together on Thursday in an overall application. What is the design flow? What are the, the aspects that we need to keep in mind? And uh, we will see that uh, not all the world is sensors because uh, a lot of IoT applications are just sensing applications that are reading data and doing some computation on that. Uh, but it's a bit weak hmm, because uh, unless you are the person that is interested in seeing those uh, charts and those data and those numbers, uh, they don't give you too much. In ambient intelligence, we try to describe how this information can turn into action, an action inside the environment. So actually not just having sensors, also having actuators that do something actually about the, the world we are living in. But I won't anticipate today what we are doing. But again, the, the pattern is the same. In the morning, I try to describe uh, the main topic, the main concept about behind ambient intelligence and uh, some description of how we teach ambient intelligence here at Polytechnico and uh, in the afternoon, which is a practical experience where we will put together in real time a real project, working project here in class uh, and uh, later we will work together to Landisco, which is one of our labs uh, here and uh, where our students work uh, and we see the project actually running with real devices into that environment mm -hmm. so it will be uh, say, a simulation of how we put it together so this is the general framework for this week mm -hmm. so we try to put together the three main uh, topics uh, no, we'll see more details later but uh, uh, network transmissions so communication uh, computation and uh, user engagement mm -hmm. into this uh, sort of frame we try to pack into a week uh, some of the most important topics about this IoT. Mm -hmm. We'll try not to speak too much about uh, protocols uh, or something like that because they are changing and evolving very quickly so there is no actually no real standard. So that just to, to, to conclude this interaction, we try to give uh, a multidisciplinary approach. So we we'll try to mix some, even us, the, the teachers, some are from the electronic department, some are from the computer science department, and we have different backgrounds. So we try to, uh, actually, IoT is a very wide topic, so it needs uh, a wide range of, uh, of, uh, of backgrounds. We try to focus on the full stack of technologies. So not just focus on, okay, uh, the MQTT protocol, we study it, and we experiment with that, that would be a very small piece. Mm -hmm. We want to try to, we will try to always keep in mind uh, of the big picture. So not too sensor-oriented, not too technology-oriented, of course we'll touch and describe technologies, but the focus will always be how these technologies are used for the big system. And the users. Probably it's a word that in the last two weeks uh, you didn't see, it, uh, you didn't hear it mentioned very frequently because you worked a lot on uh, very hard uh, technical topics about sensors and uh, photonics and so on. Something that I, I would not be, I'm a com computer guy, so I would not be able to understand that. But uh, uh, in the end, all these technologies should benefit for some users. So 
<coughs> this will be one new ingredient that we bring into the picture in this week. Okay, so let's start. Uh, this morning's introduction is organized more, uh, more or less in four different pieces. What, uh, what is the IoT? What's the definition? Uh, what are the application domains? So what are the type of applications that are currently being developed and what are the types of applications where industries are investing more? Hmm? Uh, some idea about technologies and architecture, so what are the components that you need to put together to create an IT system? And then a very personal, subjective view of the problems that we have. So why we are not there yet? Hmm? Okay, so let's start with the definition. So we are in an engineering school, so the first thing we do is to define the topic. What is IoT? And you know, the first thing you, 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 you do when you want to know something, you go to Google or a similar search engine and say, okay, please Google, define IoT. This is real, eh? they, didn't, they didn't make it up. You go to Google and write define IoT, and Google will tell you that the Internet of Things refers to the ever-growing network of physical objects that feature an IP address for Internet connectivity and the communications that occur between these objects and other internet-enabled devices and systems. There's a lot of meat here. Uh, it refers to the, so the, what the, the main <coughs> subject is here, a network. Uh, you see the grammar of the sentence, it refers to what? To a network. A network of what? Of objects. Physical objects, maybe a table, a door, or whatever. But these objects are enriched, have something more. Because these objects are some way connected. This definition is not very good because it says that okay, the connection is through an IP address for internet connectivity. Yes, but not always. Now, if you have, I don't know, a smartwatch that is connected via through Bluetooth with your smartphone, this Bluetooth connection is not IP. It doesn't have an IP address, it's not internet but it's still a connected device. So this definition is a bit too narrow because it requires that you use IP, Internet Protocol addressing, and a lot of low energy devices cannot afford to use IP connectivity because IP is too complex for them. They need to use simpler networks. I, I do this tomorrow. The sensor networks are not IP networks are simpler than that. There are special protocol for that. Okay? But anyway, so let's think about this, okay? uh, this detail. There are physical objects with some connectivity. So there is some electronics in them. Some electronics, some hardware, some software, some communication that enables the device to communicate with other devices. The communication that occurs between these objects. So I will have the mouse that will speak and exchange information with the smartphone, probably, and with the table, probably in the window. I don't know what they have to say to each other. What do they have to say? But they could technically exchange information. This is the idea. The, given the capability to objects, to exchange data with other objects and with other services, other internet-enabled devices and systems. So maybe the window will also be able to talk with uh, Google and the table will be able to post something on Facebook. I don't know. Technically, it is. So this IoT is something that gives you the capability of getting some information from the field, from objects, everyday objects, and uh, exchanging this information 
with other objects or with other services and systems. So imagine big the cloud server systems and so on. Um, of course, the examples that I made were stupid. Because it's very easy to do something stupid. Does really the, the table need to post to Facebook? No, it, it seems a stupid idea. So, half of the problem is uh, how can I enable the table to post on Facebook or to, do, or to communicate with that object? So this is the technical problem. If I want to achieve this, how can I do that? And the other half of the problem is uh, what are the useful things that they can extract from this capability of objects to send data. So what are the applications that are really useful exploiting this capability and not just the stu stupid examples that the teacher is doing in the class. Right? Okay, so this is the, our comment on the first result coming from Google and we, if we go to the second and third result, you know, never trust the first line, uh, more or less they say the same thing with different words. So second, the second result says, the IoT is a system of interrelated computing devices. So here the focus is not on the objects, but on the device. Of course, the device will be carried or will be in, in, installed inside all this. Mechanical and digital machines. So there's also physical aspect. One word that is used today, uh, that uh, some people are trying to use the, 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 the terminology, uh, cyber physical systems today. For describing that actual the IoT system and have a cyber aspect, a computing aspect, and a physical aspect. Um, mechanical digital and machines, objects, animals, why not? Some people are trying to sell some animal trackers, some colors that you put in your pet. You, we always know uh, where the animal is uh, and uh, whether it's running enough or it's feeding enough or stuff like that. Or people, or the smartphones, or watches, and we are that we were, and uh, that are provided with unique identifiers and the ability to transfer data over a network without requiring human to human or human to computer interaction. So these devices can, again, exchange data over some network. Or the Wikipedia definition is uh, the internet working on physical devices. Vehicles, oh, they forgot the other definition. Vehicles, cars, trains, buses. Very important domain. Uh, also referred as connected devices or more smart devices. Buildings. Buildings are objects or things that are full of sensors today. And other items embedded with electronics, software, sensors, actuators, and network connectivity. Okay, so all the results of our electronic studies, of our computer studies, of our networking studies converge into one physical device and give new capability to your coffee machine, to your TV, to your watch or whatever. Hmm? That's the definition coming from the internet. But we are serious people. We are serious people, we also are looking for official definition. You know, the IEEE is defining everything. They have a standard, they have a standards committee. And they have a, a website specifically for the IoT. If you go to iot.ieee.org, there's a special website about the IoT initiative from the IEEE. So let's ask the same question. Define IoT to the IEEE. To check whether they have a better, or the official, when you, are, when you are building some networking, uh, you should com be compliant with HRPOE 11, uh, 802 point, uh, 802.11, ABCD, whatever. And so, the standard should be there. And they have a page, a very promising page, that is called uh, slash definition. Okay, we got there, and we download the document. And here comes the disappointment from my point of view. This document, definition. What do you expect from a definition? One page. 
This document has 84 pages. It's dated on May 2015, 15, 16, 17, two years old, revision one. They published the first version two years ago. The IOP changed at least three times during these three years, these two years, and they didn't make a revision two for updating. So it's very sad from my point of view. So this is not revision. If you look at it, it's a more of a collection of experiences and of points of view about the general IOP topic. So it's not what they would expect. It's not updated, it's very old, two years very old in this domain. It's incomplete. Because they have a lot of experiences here and there, but it's not comprehensive, not full. So it's not very useful for us. And it's a bit. Uh, in this page, you could also have when you download the document, there is also a, a comment section where people can give comments for improving the next, who know when, revisions of the document. There are probably eight, ten comments on a, such important topic. And uh, the authors reply to these comments say, okay, let me understand better, maybe in the next revision we will integrate it. So it seems that at least the IEEE is not taking this very seriously from one point of view. Or it's too early to give a definition. This IoT is a buzzword that everybody is using, but really there's not one single meaning for everybody. It's a field of experiment. People just go in the wild and try things. Try to make these objects communicate together and try to understand what they are used. Actually, I wasn't very honest. There is a definition here in this document. In the last two pages of the document, you have two definitions. Not one. <laughs> one was too easy. They made two. The official definitions of the IT from the IEEE are two. The first one is uh, they define for a small scenario. So a small scenario IoT system is a network that connects uniquely identifiable things to the internet. The things have sensing and actuation and programming programmability capabilities. So a thing should be programmable able to have some sensors and possibly some actuators. Through the exploitation of unique identification and sensing, information about the thing can be collected and the state of the thing can be changed from anywhere, anytime, by anything. Given the permission, probably. So this is a, say, okay, if you want to put together in this room a system, you connect three things with sensing and computing capabilities, and they exchange data, and can one device can change the state of another, and a third device can read the state of a fourth sensor. But there's also a large scenario definition in the same document, the same page, actually. Say, okay, but if you have an enterprise setting, if you have a big project, a big system, such small features objects that can exchange data with other objects will not be enough. And so they have this other definition, which is heavier. Internet of Things envisions a self-configuring, adaptive, complex network that interconnects things uh, to the Internet through the use of standard communication protocols. The emphasis here is on the network. Complex networks, okay. Self-configuring self and adapting network is not something that really we have today, except in small spaces, but uh, we are not there yet. Interconnecting to the internet through the use of standard communication protocols. Remember this word, standard. Because there are probably a hundred different standards. All of them are standard, but when you have a hundred of them, <laughs> the 
they are not so standard after all. The interplanetary things at physical or virtual representation in the digital world, sensing actuation capability, a programmability feature, and are uniquely identifiable. This first row is, is interplanetary things have physical or virtual representation. It means that you have the physical object. Hi, uh, We have the physical object, but this physical object is also a virtual object, some computer node that you can exchange information with. So if C is a computer, it is a node in the cloud, and it is a physical object, both of them at the same time. OK, programmability and connectivity, we, we already know about that. The representation contains information, including the thing's identity, status, location, or any other business, social, or relevant information. This is important. If you are building a, a small scale system with uh, 20 or 50 or 100 sensors that you install yourself in your house, in your in a, in an enterprise, in a factory, you know them. You know what are the nodes, what are the things, the connected things. We know what they do. You know what are the sensors. But in a large scale, imagine a smart city. You go and walk through the streets, and every corner you take, there will be hundred new devices that are in the range of connectivity with you. What are these devices? How can you use them? So it's important that every device is able to describe itself. Say, okay, well, I have this device, I can do this action. I can give you this information. I am a traffic light. If you want to cross, please tell me. I will try to become green as soon as possible, for example. But you never saw that traffic light before. Okay? So, uh, in a large scenario, it's important to have a framework for discovering new devices. Okay, the, the, the network protocols that can do that, but also understanding what these new devices do, which is difficult because it's something on a semantic level. Um, Okay, the things of uh, services with or without human intervention through the exploitation of unique identification, again, data capture and communication, and the actuation capability. I'm happy that they brought up the actuation word here. Because it's not just sensing and computing, but also acting, doing something, closing the door, raising the temperature, sounding an alarm, moving the uh, car. The service is exploited through the user intelligent interfaces and made available anywhere, anytime, and for anything, taking security into consideration. And this last word, uh, taking security into consideration, at the end of the definition, tells us that the security well, came last in the design of the IoT. The design of the IoT is mainly of uh, uh, you know, complex network, self-configuring and so on, and then somebody probably raised their hand and said, but what about security? Oh, yeah, right. Let's put some security centers at the end. And this is not just in the definition. You take any IoT port, any IoT device, it's a disaster from a security point of view. So if you want to be extra rich or extra powerful, find a solution to the security of IoT systems. Because today, there are no solutions to the security problem. And all the IoT systems are all okay. Yes, they are insecure mm -hmm. by construction. In what sense? In all of them. Um, depends on what you include. But for example, you buy a connector uh, camera. So a camera that you put in your corner, and you can catch images and send them through Wi-Fi, to the network. So this is an is an IoT. It, it is in this definition. It fits, okay? It's a device, a physical object. It can send something and can share that over the internet. Okay. In practice, most of the connected cameras that you that you buy 
have a small operating system inside, have a management interface with a weak password. In some cases, some uh, manufacturer created some cameras with a default administration password that could not be changed. So everybody in the world knew the fact password. If you want to spend it on anything, go to Shodan. Shodan is a search engine for vulnerable IoT systems. So they will give you a list of uh, thousands of devices that you don't own, and uh, you can go there and see, connect that camera to people, because the password is weak. Because, uh, you know, you have uh, a computer, you have a, 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 what's a, 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 a tablet, Okay, that tablet will update its application every couple of weeks or days because there are new security problems every day. If you have Windows, it will update out of date every, every day, every week at least. Because there are new security problems or new worms or new viruses, you have heard of the crypto uh, viruses and so on, every day. When is the last time you found an, update, an out of date procedure for a smart fridge? For a connected camera, the manufacturers of the devices don't have a security in mind. Security means uh, access, means protocols, and means updating and keeping current. And this stuff is not happening because a lot of them are just uh, thought as devices in the, let's say, in the consumer uh, area. When I'm buying a fridge, the seller is happy when I bought it and then doesn't want to hear from me in the next 10 years. After, after sale, it's a cost. So every electronic device is thought in this way. Let's just buy something and then I forget, forget about it. And so all the security that comes afterwards, all the problems that are solved afterwards are not solved. There are no ways. So that's one, just one example, but uh, you, you can find, you know, you find the videos on the, on, the, on the YouTube of people that are able to unlock Mercedes or BMW, BMW cars. The new generation of cars that you can unlock with your smartphone. Yeah, cool. I unlock the car with a smartphone, okay? But the protocol by which the smartphone is stored into the car is not secure. And another person there just can intercept your communication and can open the car for you or can switch the motor off when you are driving. You could not imagine that. You know, a big car manufacturer, a big brand, it costs a lot of money, those cars. How, can, how could they overlook that? Well, because they come from the mechanical mentality. And then the embedded system mentality, where I have a, you know, a, a, a control unit for the engine, a control unit for the brakes, a control unit for the ABS, for the, maybe there are 20 different computers, but in, in the past, they always only exchange data in a closed system. So in a closed system, you know exactly who is sending data to whom. There's nothing unexpected. When you start to connect one of these things to the internet, the worst <laughs> comes in. If you don't think about security from the start, you're sure that you are doing something wrong. So thinking, having a, a design methodology for standalone things or standalone systems does not translate into connected devices. This is something that also big names have trouble to understand. Okay, so this was, you know, some comments on the definition. About uh, the application, application area, what, what do you use it for? Okay. Um, I hate to have one fridge like that. Uh, I already have my, my wife and my children telling me what to do and having also the fridge and the TV and the car telling me what to do, it would be too much. Uh, but Okay, so I try to, to get some objective information 
and say, okay, these are as a screenshot of a web page. Uh, sorry if uh, the, the text is too small, but uh, we read it together. About the areas of application, the domains of application, mm. where the IoT can be used. So not just for letting the table post to Facebook, but building and home automation. The first here. So smart homes, smart buildings, automation in the buildings, in the homes, uh, for, and there are some topics here, access control, so letting people in or not, uh, light and temperature control. So if you have a large building, it would be very useful, for example, to have a central place where you can control all the lights and at a given time you can switch them on, off hmm? uh, to save energy, for example. Um, <coughs> oops, sorry. Or the same for temperature control. For example, now we are going to summer, people have their air conditioning on, except in this room, right? And, uh, uh, but people are going to holiday in the next weeks. So in my department, there is one person that in these weeks, uh, every Monday, goes through office by office to turn the, the thermostat a bit higher. Because maybe some people went away and forgot the thermostat to 21 or 22. So it's sucking a lot of energy. But the people is away until maybe three or four weeks. So manually, uh, we have in these buildings an automated system, but then the thermostats are manual, uh, and are analog thermostats. So it's stupid. We are not exploiting uh, this potential for, for energy saving. Energy optimization also is the very linked. Uh, predictive maintenance. This is something that is mentioned here, but uh, is more is much more important in a in an industrial setting. Having, you know, I remember when uh, we learned about uh, you know mechanical issues, and uh, I remember some very complex diagram that was the quality chart or something like that. So, for example, you have a drill no? that makes holes, and uh, then you measure these holes and check, of course, if they are within the tolerance. Right. And you can understand that from the number of uh, holes that are outside the tolerance that your drill needs to be changed, needs to be serviced. Right? Because uh, it doesn't break from day one to day two. It will break slowly during the time. So if you analyze what your system is doing, you can predict uh, when it's going to break, and so you can replace or do maintenance before that. So it's a very, oh, every people with a mechanical background know this very well. Okay? We in electronics don't know it that uh, uh, so well. But uh, these IoT systems can give you all the information, not just about uh, when something is wrong because the sensor has a very strong reading, but also when something is expected to go wrong. And so you can plan maintenance. Do maintenance on uh, scheduled planning instead of, of doing maintenance on an emergency basis that costs uh, 10 times more. Hmm? Managers don't understand that. So they always say, okay, we want to save money, don't, don't change that lamp until it, uh, it goes off. It, uh, and then it will cost much more to call one person just for changing one lamp rather than changing them on schedule. But the technology could be used for that. Connected appliances is not really an application, it's a type of device. Connected appliances means your fridge, your TV, your microwave, your washing machine or whatever can be connected. For water, yeah, probably for uh, optimizing energy. Or probably the washing machine would tell you, okay, I finished my cycle, so come and bring your clothes. That would be useful. Especially if the washing machine is not in the same room or you need to go, I have it in the, in the, in the, in the other one, so I need to go there and check. Yeah? From the first uh, glance, it sounds like uh, you don't need really an interconnection to, uh, to the internet. Rather, local, uh, local uh, network or your own uh, yes. email or something. Uh, like with the internet, 
we build the internet uh, and we can potentially connect to every device in the world but then we build intranets where you use the same technology to manage a smaller set of devices that are only the ones uh, in our control this is more or less the same the technologies can scale to the full internet scale but a single application will probably be, be close to a specific set of devices usually in this case smart buildings uh, one thing that you want to add is always for remote control so and you want to do all of this from your home from outside the building so that is where a little bit of connectivity comes into play but you're right in many cases uh, these uh, devices exchange information potentially with any other device in the world but practically with the device in the next door in the next uh, room yeah, like yeah. No. to control temperature no you don't need but maybe you can be connected to some weather forecasting service that will tell you what is the sun in the next hour what is the rain in the next hour so you can optimize your schedule no, no need to turn on the air conditioner if, uh, if a storm is coming by so there are some connectivity so you, you, maybe you don't connect to the objects but you connect to the services that the schedule know when a day is uh, you know, when there will be a holiday when some people will be there where there's a class in the in there so in this floor we have only we are only the only ones that are occupying this class so they probably thought okay this branch is not used so we switch off the air conditioning because it's there but it's off right? uh, but actually in this class if the climate control system was connected to the class schedule system with our two real systems in this polytechnico that would be uh, so the potential is there uh, on a bigger scale when of course you need more connectivity are the smart cities smart cities or oh, smart cities are very ugly definition i don't work no? in many cases smart cities that's just uh, is used for better looking cities or more livable cities so where architects say okay we are doing where we, we are making smart cities because we are making the this uh, surrounding better mm -hmm. let's see from a technology point of view um, metering so all the metering of water gas electricity and so on can be done remotely your electricity meter your gas meter your water meter is a, a thing a connected thing is or will be every country is more or less uh, trying to uh, put connectivity into those meters okay in my house we have the electricity since 10 years so they are going to change to their new marker one last year they changed the gas meter not yet for the water probably it doesn't cost uh, too much to have uh, real data so what is what are these companies doing the utility companies are saving money on reading the meters by automating the data transmission so uh, the meter is a connected device and sends data to the utility company that will be used to, to make your bill there's one item missing I cannot read the meter in my house the electricity company knows day by day, hour by hour, how, how much electricity I'm consuming. The gas company knows hour by hour how much gas I'm consuming. I cannot have this data. So the definitions of IoT say, okay, you can read the data anywhere, any hour, any time, any whatever. But it's not real. They built a closed system instead of a connected device that can be integrated with others for business reasons of course okay hiding information is a way to make to maintain higher business margin i don't know how i how i consume my energy so i cannot open or i cannot optimize the meter they don't give me this information okay so there are some sort of hidden or closed iot networks that serve only the purpose of one of the stakeholders. We don't have yet an open system of many devices that you can connect uh, and you can exchange information for building something more. 
it's a, it's a problem. Hmm? Uh, street lights, uh, okay, pipeline leak detection, so water leaks. Uh, uh, it's very important, we have uh, tons of water every, every day that are lost uh, in the underground because some pipes are breaking and until it pops up in the street, uh, nobody mm, sees it, nobody cares about that. Uh, and you can, if you have flow sensors here and there, you can measure the flow and the pressure of the water, you can very easily understand that something's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. At the city level, I see Francesco is uh, from the uh, IT area here. We, don't, we are not even able to do that inside Polytechnic. So we are leaking, I don't know, many liters of water every day, and we don't know where, okay? Inside Polytechnic. But it's normal, everywhere is there, okay? So, but there's, there's a lot of potential for these smart applications. Uh, traffic control, so linking the cameras to the behavior, to the path, you know, you are setting a destination in your navigator. How if the navigator could speak with the traffic lights? And the traffic lights could understand that maybe 90% of the cars will want to turn right and only 10% turn left, and so just the light cycle. Not, it's not too complex, it's not science fiction. It's something that we, we, can, we are able to do with technology. We, no, but we need a mechanism for exchanging information between objects and with some algorithm, of course, that is able to, to understand that. There's a bigger topic of smart manufacturing. So how to translate all these scenarios into a factory where you have the shop floor, shop floor machines, machines that are built in things, real things, physical ones. So that you can have the sensor that can you tell you the errors the measurement, the energy consumption, the speed, uh, the number of pieces produced by every machine automatically and in real time. So they can give you a feeling in real time of how the production is going or whether there are any bottlenecks, whether there are any technical problems with the machines and so on. So in the, there's a trend of uh, when we switch from the mechanical machine to the electromechanical machine, where I mean, a lot of okay, uh, machines on the shop floor are now uh, I have electronic units uh, that control them. Now we are connecting these electronic units uh, over a local network to some machine, collects data, and is able to create a dashboard or an overview of, of what is happening now in the system. Some people are also trying to push it a bit further, not just monitoring the machines, but also monitoring the workers. That scares me a little bit. So the principle is the same. You know what the machine is doing, you also know what the worker behind that is doing. And where is it? But these are more a, of an ethical issue, not a technical issue. And, um, and many the, the predictive maintenance is important, the safety issues are important, and so on. And then there are other aspects, uh, uh, okay, this uh, automotive or transportation in general. Uh, many cars, the high-end cars, don't look at mine, are already are, are equipped with a lot of sensors. They have radars, they have cameras. You can say if you uh, trying to crash in the, in, on the car in front of you, your car will break by itself, autonomous, not by a car, uh, but a new one. Again, this information is local to the car. But how, if, if I detect that I'm going to crash in the next car, so I'm going to, to go full braking, I should be able, or my car should be able to tell that to the car behind me. Because I can avoid crashing in front, but I will surely be uh, hit from behind. Because the reaction time of the radar is millisecond. The reaction time of a user is one tenth of a second, if he's awake and active. Okay, so it's a hundred times slower. If one car could communicate to the other, oh look, I'm going to break as hell. Please do that also in Spanish. Uh, you could avoid a lot of uh, crashes in this way. Just an example. So there's a, a big potential for this. 
healthcare. Healthcare is another domain when you have people with uh, medical conditions or physical conditions, they need to be monitored. So maybe you want to be able to monitor these people at home. You don't need to keep them to hospitals or care houses that are very expensive, by the way. If only you had the possibility of uh, maybe having an alert, an information with something going bad with our physical situation, with the heart rate, with our glucose level, with our, I don't know, because I'm not a doctor. Hmm? So, today we have a lot of remote monitoring that can use sensors attached to the person that relay information to some medical analysis center and this center, when there is an anomaly, can alert the, the doctor, can alert the patient, can alert the caregivers of the patient. One big issue is also uh, the elderly population. People getting older and older, we don't have any enough hospitals for them in the next 20 or 30 years. We won't have enough money in our economy to support people getting older. And so there are a lot of efforts. This started uh, in Japan because there are a harder problems than us for the demographic uh, situation uh, of how to use technology, and IoT is part of that, uh, for helping people staying in their home, supporting them in their house instead of uh, bringing people to hospital. Uh, here we are experimenting in probably something a mixed model. So maybe every single apartment is too complex to make automated, but maybe a sort of group houses where there are people that are near independent in living, but there is a lot of monitoring and they, but they live together. So maybe there's one caregiver for 20 people instead of, of, a, of a real hospital. So and there's a lot of new models. And this is a topic where, for example, the, uh, the European Commission is putting uh, money because uh, there will be a problem. And they want solutions to, for this. Hmm? Uh, solution, especially for, for the elderly people, for the big numbers. The big numbers in healthcare are people getting older. Uh, I will comment on wearables because mainly it's not an application domain by itself. It's just one technology that can be used in other applications, for example, in healthcare, but also in sports. Oh, there are, there's a good market for sports gadgets that will tell you how fast you run. And of course, you buy it, okay, and I never use them because they would be ashamed. Okay, other charts from the market point of view. So, what is IT for? Here we have some uh, analysis about uh, the topics uh, that have been searched uh, in Google searches and tweets and so on. So, mentions on uh, articles, newspapers, search engines, and so on about the different topics. And we see, because you know, in the previous slide we have different areas, but how relevant is any of this? So from the social point of view, we see that the smart home is one of the most important. Smart thermostats, lights, uh, fridges, door locks, and so on. So the security uh, aspect uh, is very important. The energy aspect is very important in the people perception. Then second, we have uh, wearables. This is a bit old, so at the end of 2014, when there was the Google Glass uh, exp uh, X1, then people understood that uh, Apple Watches and Google Glasses are not so good uh, after all. So probably today this will be smaller. And then we have smart cities, smart grid for all the, all the metering aspects and distribution of energy and so on, industrial internet connected cars. And the rest is less important. Mm -hmm. So it's where, where are people looking for automation? And on the other hand, uh, the industry view. So this uh, is from an overview of uh, different types of uh, industrial projects at the enterprise level that were actually developed. So a company say we did this and we invested so many, so many dollars, so many euros on this project. And so where did they invest? And you see that the picture is completely different. The first one was for the end user point of view, now it's from the industry point of view. The most investment are the connected industries. 
So making production more efficient, increasing quality, increasing efficiency, and so on in the production. And then a smart city, because a lot of public administrations are investing on that. Even with simple things like changing lamps to LED lights, but they also sell it as smart city. Because by the way, an LED also has a sensor, also has some it can be controlled. So there's a little, little bit of intelligence into every traffic lamp in your city. Energy, transportation, cars, and then others. One something is, which is growing recently, I, I heard a lot of voices uh, about that, so it is agriculture. So adding sensors into the uh, greenhouses no? when you grow plants uh, and the right mix of temperature, humidity, and whatever can improve your production. Having sensors in the, in the, in the animals that, you are, that they are growing and so on. And the sensor for the so production of wines or beers, so uh, monitoring the industrial process that brings to you some food at the end. So it's something that uh, they call it uh, in some cases precision architecture. So uh, of course uh, you cannot control the weather, so uh, they are just attempts, uh, partial attempts. But you see that the industries are looking very strongly at the oh. By the way, today a lot of people is calling this connected industry Industry 4.0. You surely heard about this term for Industry 4.0. Should be the way of planning or constructing a, a, an industry with uh, a lot of where every machine, every device, every uh, element is connected with the others, and so the machine has a brain in itself. Hmm? So, more or less, this is the picture about the application areas. Um, these are publicly known enterprise IoT projects. So, projects developed by enterprises that are being published and say, okay, we are so good that we did this project. Okay? Uh, in many cases, uh, they are prototypes. They try this. But some are becoming more mature and so can be actually considered as real services. Hmm? So, the application areas are very wide. And the type of industries behind them are also very different. But all of them, in a way, share the same or very similar technologies. more or less robust, more or less costly, with different protocol, with different types of devices and sensors, but uh, they, for example, in the smart home and smart building domain, what we have? Okay, here I made a picture with a lot of, uh, of some existing technologies. Home automation, smart buildings, wearable devices, mobile devices, the Internet of Things should be here, Plus computing, internet connectivity. These are enabling technologies. And they are merging together. They are converging together. And uh, for example, uh, mobile devices are integrated with cloud services. And uh, building automation is becoming the internet of things. And uh, you know the also mobile devices are becoming part of the Internet of Things. So Internet of Things is some way a sort of a convergence point of different technologies that are all needed to create a vision of the IoT in a way. I will pick up this picture later for, add, for to add one piece. And uh, what is the vision? Of, uh, so, what are the technologies that are needed? So, this is a vision from Cisco. Cisco system, they had a presentation at the World Forum IoT in 2014, and the, pre the presentation title was very ambitious an IoT reference model. Okay, if you can do that. And uh, you see that there are many, uh, we can, of course, uh, uh, not, be, not agree on the details, on the details of the data. 
This is done by Cisco system, so you can imagine that a lot of uh, detail is given to the connectivity because they are selling connectivity devices. Okay, we know that. But the, the general feature, I think, is uh, it's important. On the lower left level, we have the, the things, the physical devices. And there we have the application. Six. The devices and the application that we are creating with these devices. The whole kind of application, the smart traffic application, the smart home application, whatever you do. The needs of some devices. Between one and six, there are several layers of technology. First of all, of course, you need uh, to have some connectivity. The devices are there, but uh, they cannot communicate uh, with each other unless we have some infrastructure for connectivity. We have some 3G, 4G connectivity. We have some Wi-Fi connectivity. Because otherwise, you, you must be really close in range to be able to communicate. So you need communication infrastructures for letting these devices communicate with each other. These devices, especially imagine a sensor, is producing data. This data should be transferred and stored somewhere. And so you need somewhere which is not inside the device. Probably it's not even inside the room or inside the building. It should be probably in some data center somewhere where you have a large, large storage capability and uh, backups uh, and reliability and so on. So it can be on the device. So the connectivity is not just for exchanging information between the devices, but also for sending their information outside to be stored mm -hmm. and processed later. Yes? Is there any definition for the length of such a link for each device like this? Uh, it depends on the, or depends on the technology. For example, if you have a, uh, a device with a, with a 4G SIM module, like a smartphone, it can go to maybe 100 meters until the next cell tower. Right. Is that the question you are asking? No, I'm talking about the object. Okay. The object should have certain range of the communication. Yeah. Is there any yeah. It, yeah, it depends on, on, the, on the communication protocols that these objects are using. So there are some short range protocols, for example, ZP and Z Wave that are very used, uh, have a range of 20 meters without walls. And after that, they need repeaters. But they can talk to each other directly or this range. Okay. Uh, Blue Hood, uh, the latest version is also comes to the range of tens of meters. The 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 other one are only some meters. These are rather known standards, but I'm talking about new ones. Uh, the, you will see this afternoon at Telecom, they are pushing a lot the uh, NB IoT, Narrow Band IoT protocol. Uh, should have a range of about, uh, well, it's a very low power consumption, a moderately low bit rate. It has a range of uh, hundreds of meters. Hundreds. So you need to cover a city, you need a lot of antenna. It's more or less in the same of the, the, the 5G antenna. They are in the same frequency as 5G. So they need a, 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 an antenna, an antenna every, every 100 meters, which is some sort of public infrastructure. Then you can have some private infrastructure inside your building, you can go short. But that is not the only one that's coming. Some, in this case, Telecom Italia is investing in narrow band IoT. Other companies are investing in ultra wide band uh, technology. So there are competing ones. We don't, standard is a very dangerous word. Okay. Especially future standard. <laughs> I didn't say it's dangerous. No, it's, uh, everything is standard uh, from the people who are working. But uh, accepted, or globally accepted standard is more. Um, okay, I mean, we want to connect devices and to computing centers where we can store data. In many cases, we don't want 
to send all the data from here to there. Too much data. We don't have the bandwidth, we don't have the computing power, we don't have the energy batteries. So in many cases, in many architecture, we have some uh, edge computing element. What does it mean? Some node, a computer, even a small, a small and better computer, that already does some computation in the edge, so on the field. Edge from the point of view, you know, Cisco says the center is the cloud. Okay, so the edge is uh, towards the user, towards the client. So edge computing could be some application on your smartphone that takes data from your smartphone, this is not a smartwatch, by the way, but takes data and doesn't send the data, all the data from the smartphone to the cloud. Only does some computation locally and send the results of the computation. So you are exploiting local computation nodes, first. Second, you are reducing the bandwidth of communication with the cloud. Third, you can do local decisions here, on the edge. You don't need to send data there and uh, uh, wait that somebody understands that something is wrong and then go back to the device. You can act locally. So, something you can do already locally. You can probably have some architecture that talks here. Real-time control systems are like that. Only these three data. Get data, compute locally, and maybe decide something. In real-time, we don't need the history. We don't need the intelligence. We just apply filters. Then, if you want to do something more sophisticated, you need to store data, and you need to aggregate this data, put it together, deleting wrong samples, comparing with the task, <coughs> extracting trends, checking anomalies, a lot of crunching on the numbers. That of course should be in some powerful data center. And the output of this number crunching could be going down and doing something. So I am detecting that the temperature is growing in the next two hours. So let's start maybe the air conditioning sooner. Maybe. So from the analytics of the data, we can make, uh, we can give some orders, intelligent orders to the field, to the device. Mm -hmm. Or you can go up to the user, to a human user. We, we have this data, we have the information, we show it to the user. Mm -hmm. And the user will understand, will take action or not. You see a lot of uh, health tracking, you know, running, rest, and so on, will give you a nice report at the end of the day, at the end of the week, you were better, you were worse, uh, you were better than your friend, and so on. They are just getting data, it's a, just monodirection, a unidirection, from the sensors up, up, up to the user. And a lot of uh, IoT systems is just unidirectional. Sensing, they are big sensing systems, aggregated sensing systems. Only very few of them actually go down and do something because it's more difficult, because more dangerous, doing the right thing at the right time. Without the user? Yeah. If you can trust it, I would, look, I would do it. Your fridge in your home is switching on and off on its own schedule. It doesn't ask for permission. It's very system. No, it just works on a temperature hysteresis expression. Okay. You trust it. You trust it. Your parents are in your home also. So why don't we trust it? Uh, the, the airbag in your car is firing autonomously without your intervention. So, something that we don't care about the details, uh, but we want it to be done, because it's more efficient. Something that we cannot have the, the, the speed to react. And so we want to have a system which is faster than us. So there are already systems that are acting without the user interface. Anticipating the user, or just uh, relieving the user from dealing with those details. It can be increased. The issue is that, uh, and there, here where the user comes into play, the user should trust and accept the system, and the system should not play tricks on the user. Something that they say is that the, the boundary 
between a chum house of the house with the uh, uh, fairies and everything is nice uh, you, you are in the castle the princess uh, everything is done automatically no? uh, and the boundary with the wicked house no? with witches <coughs> that uh, do actually the opposite of what you are doing they're trying to the boundary is very narrow the difference is not only whether the action that the house is doing is what you would have done or expected or what you wouldn't have done or wanted in this moment so we are running a very thin line but the potential is there a lot of energy optimization is already taking place like this people who have solar panels on their roof they are already relying on a system like this that decides second by second whether to take energy from the solar panel from the battery or from the utility you don't want to do that So something can be already caused on the local level, something can be caused after some computation, and something can be shown to the user and waiting for some user action, some user comment. That is uh, the different one, two, or three levels in which we can have some control loops, feedback loops. Um, this is another picture from another person just to show that uh, different researchers have more or less different point of view um, but more or less they they look at that they start from the devices and then uh, co connectivity of devices management of data and then applications and interfaces broadly taken okay so you can find maybe 20 or 50 pictures like this on the internet they always look like this different layers with different technologies devices connectivity data interfaces and uh, intelligence somewhere one thing that is very ugly for me of this picture is that here they are only mentioning sensors they forgot about actuators that is one symptom of the fact that the IoT, in, for many people, is a huge sensing platform and not a huge control system that looks back to the device. Okay, in this architecture, what do we have in the layer? We have computing nodes. This is just a uh, development platform with some. We have today. There are a lot of different embedded platforms. Uh, take the simplest one, the Arduino, the Raspberry Pis. Uh, uh, simple to use, cheap, uh, easy to deploy. That we can use, and there are also they uh, they are they don't consume too much power and can be used, and they are powerful. They are full operating system from them, and you can use them as a computing node for creating an embedded system with your camera, with your microphone, with your sensor, with your actuator around it. They have connectivity capabilities. So they're actually, we have a lot of, I was speaking last year, we want people, we want one person from the ST microelectronics uh, and say, okay, we are building some chips, uh, mi miniaturized chips, uh, microcontroller, very powerful. We don't know the applications that will be able to exploit all the computing power that we have. We have more computing power in small chips, low power chips, than what we can use, do with them. That is where this edge computing comes into play. This edge is not very used today. A lot of IoT projects uh, are coming from, uh, or proposals, are coming from the telecommunication industry. And you can understand the telecommunication industry or the cloud services industry don't want this. Don't want this edge computing. Don't want to compute it on the field. Because they want you to send gigabytes of data per month. And they want to send you the storage and computing on their clouds. And they want to retain all the full ultimate control over your devices. So they say no local intelligence. From my point of view, we have more computing power for doing also local intelligence. How to do that is not clear. 
For example, in the new 5G standards that they are working on for telecommunication, there is an explicit layer of uh, edge computing, or fault computing as they call it. So the possibility of integrating into the network also some local computing capabilities. And then we have uh, the universe. We have uh, sensors of every type and kind and color and measure and uh, capability. Can, if you want to sense something, you, you will find a sensor. I had a group of students that wanted to understand whether in a, in a fruit shop the bananas were rotting or not. And they found a sensor for acetylene or some gas like that, uh, that actually is the gas that is being freed by the bananas <laughs> when they come back. back. So actually, he, today in the market you can find every type of sensor. It, of course, maybe some are more or less costly because they are more complex. Uh, there was a sensor for uh, air pollution, sensor for uh, electricity, temperature, uh, lightning, fire, smoke, uh, everything. You name it. I didn't find any physical quantity that couldn't be measured today with a sensor that can be easily connected to one of these computing platforms. So, cheap computing platforms cheap and available sensor for everything, you can build whatever you want. The wearable devices are still increased. This is an old picture, by the way, but this is, for example, a, these are medical devices. This one, this one. This is a patch that you put somewhere in your body, you will measure some, for some days, your condition. This will be put in your clothes, and you measure your movement, and so on. So there are more and more devices that you can wear, it will become part of you. Uh, if you take any smart home technology, again, you have uh, everything. This is a picture that they took from one of these smart home uh, uh, plant manufacturers. They will sell you devices, and they can sell you devices for remote control, economic remote, window control, thermostat, security, light switch, light, uh, 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 air conditioning, security, you know. Everything. Yeah. This is today, not tomorrow, not the future. Mm -hmm. Today we already have uh, hundreds of different sensors, appliances, this something, smartphone devices of different kinds. Uh, these are very nice, for example, for our German devices that uh, are using the what was the name? Um, a protocol that doesn't need a, a transmission protocol that doesn't need any batteries. It's very interesting. They do energy harvesting. So, for example, with your finger energy, when you are pressing the button, mm -hmm. you are powering the chip that will send the signal. So it doesn't need any battery. You are just exploiting your your finger, uh, and some of them are exploiting uh, thermal differences. So if you put something in your uh, Okay. Of this, uh, it will then have one, it will be hotter on the inside and, and colder on the outside, so there's a uh, thermal difference and you can extract energy from this thermal flow. So there are very nice things uh, that are coming up uh, in this world of sensors. You really, um, a, a very interesting world. Uh, the warning that they put is uh, we don't want, I don't want to get too much involved uh, into the sensors because they're just the enabling technologies. We are engineers, we can get enchanted about uh, uh, you know, uh, sensors, that, uh, the, the energy of a sensor. But the real users don't care. They care that something is working well in their car, in their home, in their house, in their company. So we know that the sensor technology is there. A lot of people are doing research, but this is an example of some smart building uh, uh, systems and that. I mean, it's just the beginning. People is getting aware of the systems, not by the sensor, but by the interfaces. Today, there's a lot of interfaces that are, that are based on voice. I don't like them, sure. but it's not important. They're not so reliable yet, but uh, you know, Amazon Alexa is selling big. Yeah. 
and it's a purely voice control device. Doesn't have any screen, any keyboard. And so uh, you, can, you can, through Alexa, you can order something. Please, Alexa, order me, you know, uh, a smartphone. Or you can ask uh, what is the what will be the weather in Turin next week. Or you can, you, or if Alexa is connected to some compatible device in your house, uh, please, Alexa, unlock the phone door or raise the temperature. So by voice, is that? respond by voice and do the act. And it's something that for people which are not technical people, it's very interesting. You know, in every science fiction movie, computers are, speak, are speaking. People speak with computers. So, I always look at science fiction because we I mean some creative, creative people have tried to imagine how the future could look like. And voice interaction with machines, with the environment, is normal there. So, this is a very promising way. Instead of learning to swipe with your mouth. Mm -hmm. It's good for gaming, but not for the interaction. Uh, I tried last, yes, Thursday, no, yeah. yesterday, no, please. Uh, Friday, I tried the HoloLens. HoloLens is the, the augmented reality device by Microsoft. Really cool. It's a uh, real one well. And uh, actually, you wear this, and you see objects. You, this is transparent. You see the room, and you see 3D objects floating in the room. And you can interact with these objects. But these objects are, um, let's say, reference to the space. So if I have uh, you know, the planet Earth here, I can walk around it. And as I move, they will, they will show me the different angles. So I see, sir. Uh, Link the room because the, 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 the device is keeping track of my position in, in with six degree of freedom inside the room, and so we'll recreate the 3D scene in real time. It's really engaging. Yeah, so we are going to finish at 11. 11? 11, only two hours today. Okay, so that's why. Right. And uh, okay, so the user interfaces are becoming more and more natural, more and more intuitive, more and more based on physical objects. So the physical objects will no longer be just the sensor. They will be also the interface. You know? This idea, sorry, this idea, I will skip a couple of slides, of a transparent computer, disappearing computer. So, uh, an IoT system that will be acceptable by the user needs to be disappeared. People don't want to see computers. Mm -hmm. Don't want to push buttons on computers. They don't want to do, what, do the thing. Do the, what they want. And maybe interact with the room, with the environment, with the car. Not with the keyboard on the car or with the screen on your house. I have one example. You are driving a car. When I took the driver license, cars were totally different objects from today. I learned that when I push the throttle, there would be a wire that will open a small valve that will let more gasoline go inside the motor. And when I turn the wheel, there will be a set of, I learned that when I did my uh, driving license exam. Nowadays, it's so totally false. It's no longer true. When I press the throttle, this pressure signal will be read by a sensor that will go into, into an electronic control unit that will apply an algorithm and decide when and how much you are going to inject into the cylinder. There's no doubt in it. But I still can drive. The system has changed from a mechanical system to an electronic system. From something that executes direct commands to something that applies algorithms. But the user interface is still the same. Steering wheel, throttle, gear, and so on. 
Behind that, everything is different. Everything. Even when I brake, I'm not closing the brakes. I'm telling the front of the unit, please, I want you to slow down, decide what to do. How, how, how strong you brake and, uh, and compensate, or depending on whether I'm, I'm steering or not at the same time. So, can we do that with computers, with smart environments? Can we make a, smart, a room, a, a house, uh, with the same interface as before? So we can leave it without knowing that it's intelligent, but just better. It behaves better without requiring me to learn how to make it better. This is the philosophy that we are trying to follow. Okay, in the last five minutes, I just only want to share you, with you four main concerns about all of this evolution of the IoT. I'd like IoT to be if you ask me, okay, what are the main concerns, main issues that you want to be solved? I have these four. Useful, easy, safe, or secure, and durable. I will give you examples. Two examples for one of these. Real examples. Useful. I have, I have taken these pictures from one Twitter account. The Twitter account is called the Internet of Shit. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, a, there's a, a guy that tries to collect very bad ideas about the IoT application in the world. One is a smart scarf. You know, scarf that you put around your neck. And this scarf has a sensor over there from May and Weaving, February 2017. It's a new product, don't you have it yet? And it will give you, the sensor will give you your smartphone information <laughs> about what? I have no idea how, how can it be useful to have a connected scarf. I don't know. Maybe for not losing it? I don't know. Okay, useful. This other one, Tweepy from Agis. You know, Agis is a very strong brand. This is a sensor that you put in your child pen that will, sorry, that will give you a notification where, when you know, the humidity in that environment is too high. Well, I had three children. I never had that, felt the need for that. Okay, you, you know, you know when it's time to change it. Mm. You know from the smell. You know from the gait, how they walk. You, you know, you don't need this, really. You know that you forget your child. Hey, okay, there's some pee. I need to remember that they are a child and go and change. Okay, these people are trying to get funding in the market, trying to get money to create this product. It's a huge market, IoT. Everybody's saying, hey, we, we want to do IoT, but the good ideas are few. The stupid ideas are more. You thought that the, the table uh, posting on Facebook was a stupid idea? Well, these are better or more stupid. Mm. Easy. This one on the left is a um, uh, I don't know in English word something you something where you cook with pressure. I don't know if I if I can sorry pressure pot. Okay, so it's cold. Yeah, automatically cold. You dry so that you can cook uh, with a hard pressure and lower temperature. Okay. And this one is a Wi-Fi connected one. So with your smartphone, you can control the temperature and so on. The issue is that there was a speech, this person, a tweet that gave a comment that said that uh, there was a bug and the uh, Wi-Fi connectivity doesn't work. So it has some food inside. It cannot open it because the Wi-Fi doesn't connect anymore. It uh, doesn't uh, react to comments and so on. 
So it's uh, maybe there is a procedure to reset it. Maybe if you look at the manual, there should be some procedure to reset or to open uh, membership mode. I, I believe that. But you know, a, a man or a lady who is cooking that moment wants something easy to use. Darty immediately, you don't, don't want to read manuals to open your pot. And to all the, all the cooking going bad because uh, uh, you, you lost uh, 15 minutes trying to open it. That should be easy, immediately. These are trying to sell this uh, blue food uh, lock. I, I, I really can't understand it. Uh, you know, you go to a gym, you go to a swimming pool, you lock your items with a lock. You need to have the key or remember a combination of numbers. That's easy. Now, here I need to carry the lock, take the smartphone, pair with Bluetooth, unlock the phone with the pin of the, of the phone, and then send the command, okay, close it and send, uh, close it on the smartphone. And then when I come back, I will pick the smartphone that, uh, and and unlock the smartphone, enter the ping, and then unlock the clock. And, and in all this, just remember, I cannot lock my, my phone inside. That is probably the only thing that I need to protect, to lock inside. Because I need the, the, the phone outside to be able to unlock the lock. That's strange, okay? This is a real picture I saw in, with, with my own eyes of a smartphone where there was too much automation. On every door, more or less, there were something like this. One, two, three blocks of three uh, switches. Because they were for opening the doors, switching the lights, uh, the curtains, uh, temperature, and so on. People living there could not understand, could not learn that. By the way, the electrician who mounted it were just trying to act uh, intelligent instead of mounting them horizontal like every place in the world be turned back in a vertical place. So there are one, two, three instead of one, two, three. So this is just kind of strange to begin with. Then they changed the color of the flax uh, without any reason. Probably they had a lot of different color flags in the back, they put that on the red one. So you try to understand, okay, the red should mean something different from the white. No, it doesn't. It's purely the red one adding confusion to confusion. So what happened is that the people could not remember what the, what the switches do. We already in our homes, normal, uh, can sometimes uh, use the, the, the wrong switch. Imagine every nine of them. You, you never, in every room, they will be different. In every door, they will be different. You cannot remember. So what they did is to put small icons, this is the second iteration already, next to a switch. So instead of going there and trying on them all, you go there and try to look at the icon. What does the other icon mean? What does it do? And you spend one minute and try to figure, OK, this is for recent life. Huh? The next step will be the people living in the house just to put some scotch tape on that. Don't touch this. And, uh, and say, OK, let's, let's try to remember this is really the latest value. So a lot of technology not easy to use. The error here was uh, trying to put too much technologies, thinking that more, the more technology, the better. No. The user doesn't want to be overwhelmed with technology. He wants something easy, direct to use. Only the things that he needs. Safety. Safety is, uh, we already mentioned that before. Mm. This map here is a map of a uh, uh, denial of service attack. You know, this distributed denial of services happens every day. Every day there is some hacker that sets off a bot of uh, thousands of machines that are being fed by a virus and try to target one single website to bring it down with a lot of traffic. Distributed denial of service. It's distributed because it uses a lot of computers and the goal is deny denial of service. So, uh, uh, making it impossible to run the regular service. It happens every day. What does this picture as, as, as a, so special? This picture is the first time when the distributed denial service attack was executed by using connected cameras. 
all the chemicals we were uh, talking before, they were infected with the virus, and they took them over, and in one day, all these cameras, all the, that are millions in the world, started sending messages to one website to break it down. So all these devices that are not secure will be much more difficult to, to correct, because <clears throat> all of these cameras today are still there. It's not that Microsoft could push an update to all, all the Windows uh, um, applications. People owning these cameras don't know what happened. And the owner of the camera, the, the manufacturer of the camera, has no way of reaching the user. It's been on the market. In, in, in. So all these devices will still be there for years. And they're totally unprotected and totally infected. Welcome to the IT. Alexa, we mentioned Alexa before. Very nice. You give speech commands. Well, everyone who gives speech commands to Alexa. So, what's happening is that one person was watching the TV. On the TV, there was a commercial for Alexa. And in the commercial, there was one person, the actor of the commercial, saying something to Alexa. Alexa, play my whole entire And that was said on the, on the TV, and the Alexa in my home, in that home, listened to that message and executed it. This was quite. But say, so imagine your, your neighbor that shouts, Alexa, switch the lights on. You're in the middle of the night, something, uh, or, or somebody, Alexa, open the, the front door, tuck, and uh, everyone, everyone, everyone gets in. Because this uh, device has uh, voice recognition, but doesn't have speaker recognition. It responds to voice, but it doesn't recognize who is speaking. So if you can reach there with audio through a, through a, um, um, a loud, um, um, loudspeaker, through the window, through the radio, through the TV, you can execute any command in anybody else. The same as Google Voice is trying to sell. So there are, it's not a detail that can be fixed. It's an essential model of a device that has been designed and manufactured and implemented very well without even thinking once about security. And Amazon is not the latest in the world. They have the resources. And uh, the last example is about durability. Well, the thing is that uh, when, they, when you build your house, you build your house, your apartment, you're thinking in decades. I'm building an apartment that should last 20, 20 30, 40 years at least. The walls, the door. And then you put them inside electronics that have uh, today the electronics have a life cycle of uh, six months. Every six months there are new devices, and every two or three years you have to replace your smartphone with a new one. And the new one probably will have different features, different technologies, different uh, products, different spans. So we are mixing something that goes in the cycle of decades with something that goes in the cycle of semesters or months. You can imagine. These people, Revolt, had a very nice program. It was a smart home, a smart home controller. It's nice, this red box here can be controlled by your smartphone. And this red box, the home gateway, controls the lights, the doors, uh, or everything in your house. Fine. Some thousand people bought it. It's not a huge success, but thousands of families have had one of these in their house. Good product. So another company called Nest, and you probably know it because the other company they invented Nest Thermostat, which is a very nice uh, device for an intelligent thermostat in your house, connected one. Nest bought Revolve because it was a good company, it could boy, it, they could make synergy. Okay, it happens every time. A startup buys, an, buys another startup. Then Google bought. Next. 
Next is now a division of Google. And Google one day say, okay, what do we have here? Oh, we have a lot of startups, but what is this robot doing? Ah, something we don't doesn't bring money. It's only a cost to support it. Shut it down. <coughs> it was 0, 0.0000 something percent of Google. So they really didn't think twice about shutting that down. That meant that the day after, people in their houses could no longer control the lights, could no longer open the doors. Why? Because it didn't have, this device didn't have any, no, local computation. Everything was done in the cloud. The cloud was switched off and the device became useless. You have a device, you buy it, you use it for one year, and then from one day to the next, because somebody on an Excel sheet decided that this, this revenue is not enough, you are no longer enabled to use what you have, the physical objects that you have in your house. Or you bought them. You cannot use them anymore. Because they are not objects, actually you are buying a service. And when the service is switched down, the objects become useless. Well, bad for these families. But if instead a family would have been a city, a building, how can we protect against, uh, well, in this case it was a, a success story, because uh, uh, right, Google bought them. But if something goes bankrupt, how can we run this device? And another story is from Philips, and then I talk. Philips is doing the smart lamps, the U lamps, probably you know them, where you can change, the yeah, connect the lamps with the B protocol, you can change the color, you can change the lighting, everything for your app or for my, okay. Philips decided to use uh, Zigbee as a wireless protocol for their lamps. Great. Zigbee is a naturally standard. So they did the right choice. And instead of inventing a new protocol incompatible, they used a standard one. Great. What happened the next day? That a lot of other manufacturers, from the East, for example, started to produce compatible lamps that cost less. You create, you buy the U lamp controller from Philips and you buy the lamps from China over the internet. They both speak uh, the Zigbee protocol, they work together. And then, the next step, uh, Philips uh, discovers that. And he say, well, people are using my system with some other lamps. And they are decreasing my revenue. They should be my money, my lamps. I want to sell them. So they pushed an update, a software update to their controller. And from the next day, only the Philips original lamps were working. And all the other ones were no longer working. This was a bad move for Philips and for their reputation. Because a lot of users say, okay, but we invested in your product, we just want it to be open, uh, interoperable with other devices. Why do you shut it down, shut them down? And if you claim that you are ZB compatible, is it, either you are compatible or you are not. If it's a standard, you cannot just pick the part of the standard that you want. I use this standard only with these devices. Like if the Polytechnic had only the Wi-Fi for Apple devices. No, if it's Wi-Fi, every device that is Wi-Fi certified should be able to connect. That's it. So there was a lot of reactions of customers. They said, okay, we bought your products and now we can, you, you can, we, we can use them. We trust that you are implemented in the big standard, you are not, because you tweak it uh, in order to recognize only your own device. And in less than one week, uh, Philips uh, rolled back the update. And now it's still, they learned that it's better to be open, it's better to be compatible with other products than trying to force the user into a narrow set of devices on, created only by you. Even the largest technology provider is not big enough for satisfying all the users. You should play, you should do a game, a game play, not a, no, a narrow um, prison for your users. So these are 
All these are not really technical issues. Are the way in which we are using the technologies of the IoT to create services and products. And let's try, in my view, to try to solve these problems. Okay, I thank you for your patience. Sorry if I've been uh, 10 minutes longer. Uh, that's all for today. If you have some uh, question or discussion, I will be here until it's needed. Otherwise, uh, we'll meet uh, at uh, 2, 2 15 for going to Telecom today. Uh, I should probably collect the, the sheet with the signatures if they are still around or not. Okay. Thank you.